السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله شيخ How are you doing? الحمد لله الحمد لله we are all well all uh, waiting for a new session to start إن شاء الله today إن شاء الله إن شاء الله إن شاء الله today we are going to talk about the uh, after Ramadan correct yes أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله على آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد All praises due to Allah May Allah's peace and blessings be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم uh, Consistency in our life is a required attribute to survive as a human race. Um, and subhanAllah, you find that regardless a person is good or bad, those who are consistent, they arrive at their goal faster and more efficient. And again, I'm talking in general here, not talking about what should be done and what should not be. You find those who are consistent in certain things. I give you a couple of examples here to make this clearer. Um, some people say, like, to be good at your job, you have to believe in yourself, you have to do this, and you have to do that. Yeah, great. All of these, theoretically, idealistically, they are wonderful, amazing, encouragement words, right? Uh, to succeed in your marriage, you have to trust your spouse, you have to do this, you have to do that. All, all these are, like, foundationally good. But what actually makes any relationship or any work successful is the consistency. To be consistent and willing to put effort, hours, money, resources, um, you know, all of that. Everything else becomes a helping factor. To become consistent. A person... They said he's a very, very good pilot. It's a very good pilot is not because he is having a good mood. Yeah, having a good mood is good to fly and be good and all of that. Yeah, but that's good. But what makes them a good pilot? Ready to take executive, executive decisions, ready to make maneuvers, ready to make uh, quick decisions at times of hardship or calamity. The hundreds or the thousands of hours that they put. That's why you find the best of pilots are the old ones, the ones who are about to retire, or the ones who have military experience, for example, because they flew, you know, fighter jets and they did things in very narrow escapes and all of that. Then, you know, they are very comfortable driving under peaceful conditions. So those who are in hard conditions, they are easy to function in simple or normal conditions. Um, same thing with uh, people who work. You find that their performance uh, becomes good based on their skill, their uh, willingness, their attitude. Uh, that's great, wonderful. Customer service, you find a person like is very good and smiling, how are you doing, and all of that makes you feel good as a customer. Wonderful. But what made them good in what they do is they're consistent. They are doing it consistently. They wake up every morning and tell themselves, I'm going to have a good attitude today. So good attitude is not what made them successful. No, keeping that good attitude consistently is what made them successful. So whenever you go, you'll find that person is number one in customer service and the number one in customer relations and all of that. What makes them number one? Because every customer gives the same feedback. That means they were consistent. There are different customers saying the same thing, but saying the same thing about the same person. What is from the other side? What, what is that? He said, everybody loves that person. He did not deal with everybody at the same time. He said, okay, this person is a very good teacher. What makes them a very good teacher? Generation after generation, class after class, they are saying this is the good teacher. 
But from the other side, they were being consistent in what they do that make everybody give them that positive feedback. I hope the idea is there. So what makes us go back after Ramadan? Because we're not consistent. If you're not consistent before Ramadan, you're not going to come suddenly consistent after Ramadan. You were consistent during the month of Ramadan, doing the same thing. But before that, there was no consistency. And after that, there will be no consistency. Unless you start dedicating time and effort for that consistency to take place, therefore, you get the result. So let's put them in order. You have the intention, you have the willingness, then you have a plan to execute. And then you want to continue doing the same thing for the sake of Allah. Now we're talking about worship. Now. Then after a while, you can call yourself, I was consistent in praying Fajr before sunrise. I was consistent in doing Astaghfar 10 times every day. I'm consistent on praying on time, five times a day. I'm consistent in reading half page of Quran. I'm consistent in doing Tahajjud once a week. I'm consistent in fasting three days every month. I'm consistent when my husband talks to me, I reply like that. I'm consistent when my children have this issue, I'm going to handle it like that. I'm consistent when I talk to my parents, I talk like that. I'm consistent when I solve problems, I solve it like that. When you reach that, you become successful. So success comes after all of that. The intention, the willingness, the plan to put what effort and resources needed. Then you continue doing it, to continue doing it, and you continue doing it till you become consistent and better at it. Then you become successful. Then you can say, Alhamdulillah, I, I, I've been doing Salah in the past this many years, or I've been doing Tahajjud this past many years, and I can feel the results of it. But we go from the other end and say, oh, I didn't feel anything. You know, I made a survey uh, about Ramadan. I don't know if you got the two questions or not. You know, Abdul Hamid is sending to everybody. Have you noticed or felt some uh, spiritual difference during the month of Ramadan? Majority of the people in the community said yes, but majority of those who were surveyed or the, the participants survey said no, no difference. Have you found yourself committing to an action that you started in Ramadan? I'm not talking about things that you normally do. No, something that you picked up in the month of Ramadan, this last month of Ramadan, and you still don't get. Again, majority of those who surveyed said yes. Yeah. Now, when I look at it, analyzing it, what do I see? Let me ask you that question first, and you reply, and let's go from there. What do you see from the answers that I just gave you? The first question, have you felt some spiritual difference, like you are better spiritually during the month of Ramadan? And the answer was yes. And some said no. About 5% or so said no. Majority said yes. The other one, have you picked up something after Ramadan that you started in Ramadan? 75% said yes, but 25 said no. What do you see there, sisters? Go ahead. Can you hear me? You unmute yourself, please. Can anybody hear me? Uh, yes, Sheikh, we hear you. I'm just waiting for the other sisters to answer. <laughs> they're, they say they're thinking about it. They're thinking about the answer right now. <laughs> Like what you what do you see? Like whenever I, I you know, see what I just told you now, 75% of people, I mean, 90% uh, of people, 95% of people said that they felt something nice. They felt spiritual in Ramadan, but there are 5% who said they didn't feel any difference. 75% and for the other question said that, yes, we continue doing something that we started in the month of Ramadan. And the others said, no, we have not. 25%. So when I 
when you look at this picture in front of you, what is your impression? Like, what, what is your reflection? Like, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Nobody want to say anything? Sister Mariam, do you have something to say? Hi all. Um, SubhanAllah, either, either people were already uh, doing something that was, uh, uh, they, they were being consistent within Ramadan and uh, mm -hmm. And, and no, now there's not, a... not, not not necessarily relating to consistency. I'm I'm not asking mm -hmm. that question. I'm asking what do you see when you see that statistic in front of you? First of all, to help yourself mm -hmm. find the which category, be honest, okay? Which category you belong to? The one that saw some spiritual feeling or the one who did not see any difference? The mm -hmm. one who actually doing something that was in the month of Ramadan, or you are among those who did not pick up something in Ramadan. Let's start with that. Yes. That's the first thing, right? Yes. The first thing, you, you see that statistic, you see where you belong, correct? Yes, of course. So where do you belong? Yeah, alhamdulillah. I, I think, um, I mean, regardless uh, of uh, my personal experience, I believe everybody picks up something in Ramadan. There's, um, uh, And even if we say that we are not emotionally attached or, or spiritually at attached to the month of Ramadan, there's there's got to be something disastrous happening Uh uh, subhanAllah. But um, I think it's uh, probably if you ask this question now, we will still be continuing the same uh, practices uh, for at least the month of, uh, for at least this one month. Um, I feel maybe uh, after okay. after two months or something, <laughs> then you're, the you're, answers will change. You are, you, you're going to be a very good diplomat, Sister Maria. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> now, when we talk statistics, we're not trying to brag. We're not accusing anybody in their intention. We're not doing any of that. We just want accuracy, right? We want to get an actual feel of the community. Let me show you how, everybody. For myself, let's say, as Sheikh Mamdou, did I pick something new in this Ramadan that I continue doing after Ramadan? No. No. And I'm saying it in complete objectivity here. And I'm not saying it out of pride or I'm doing everything right. No. There are certain Ramadans I do, certain Ramadans I don't. And there are reasons. Let's talk about reasons like that, you know. Uh, did I feel uh, something different spiritually? Yes. A little bit. This Ramadan. It was a little different for me. Uh, maybe because I have uh, settled, you know, uh, on the family front. I got married, alhamdulillah, I got my PhD, I got all of that. Those things were worrying to me, past a few Ramadans, five, six Ramadans were worrying for me or exhausting me and all of that. But this Ramadan, I was at peace, at ease. So I had a, a good spiritual experience. Maybe someone in the Atikaf will have more spiritual experience. Maybe someone who is just a new Muslim will have more spiritual uh, experience, right? I mean, spiritual experience. Maybe someone who was not practicing and they repented to Allah Azza Jalla, so they have a wonderful experience. You get it now? You see where, where I'm coming from? So I'm not trying to judge. So those statistics, when I look at them, I say they are representative of my community. So basically, um, this is what my community have. I have a segment in my community that they are maybe there is something preventing them from having the spiritual experience. I'm not going to accuse them that they are bad people. I'm not going to do that. So you as sister's class, sister's mentorship class now, um, uh, you should think as leaders. Oh, so there are some people in the community might be spiritually suffering or struggling. How can we help? But we judge fast and we feel like uh, reserved. I don't want to speak about my spiritual experience, or I don't want to judge people, or I don't want to be the bad person. No, that's no, we're not here to do that. And this, this um, first question, 
was not intended. Actually, the first question was more for the second question. Like, you know, second question is what I intended, not the first question. So I'm the one who put those questions. So second question was the intention. Second question, like, have you picked up something new in Ramadan and you continue doing it? Like, I, I said it in a different way. I said, you know, have you been doing something that you picked up in Ramadan? That means there is something that you started in Ramadan. So that question had like a subtle question embedded in it. <laughs> so everybody think like, okay, after Ramadan. But I was actually thinking about adopting a new habit in Ramadan. <laughs> so that was the subtle agenda here in this. Those questions you put them, you have to have some psychological foundation, some social foundation, be aware of the community and all of that. So yeah, so this is what I'm trying to get to. Like what would make us not consistent? If I ask that question now and I need some participation from sisters here. And I'll tell you why I'm asking that question in a minute. So tell me what would make you not consistent? You, speak about yourself. Please don't speak about others, please. Like let's learn this new habit of I have issues with consistency when such and such happens or when I have those deterrents. Don't talk about others. Talk about yourself. So what would make you not consistent in certain things? Um, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. For me, it's like if I don't prioritize um, and I don't give it more importance, then it goes, it slips off my mind and I'm not consistent at it. So you mean you have a list and then you prioritize the list? Yes. Okay. Who else? Very good, For by the way. I would say for me, it's because of the short-term goals. Like I have a long-term goal for Ramadan, for example, I have a shorter term goal, like finishing the Quran at the end of the month. So it helps me kind of become consistent to reach that goal. And I, I want to do that for, which I'm not able to yet, but I want to have that small goal so I can reach it. And when I, I do I, that, I, I am I'm more point. persistent. That's what I get. <laughs> Very beautiful point. And I have the solution for you. Just hold for a second here. <laughs> I, it's, it's good. It's good, actually. What, what you described is, is has a solution in it. But uh, you have to reflect on it a little bit. And you actually have your own solution in your own issue. Who else? Um. For me, it's the lack of assessment before Ramadan starts, uh, just, uh, just to be able to kind of uh, see where I stand and what I, I mean, e even the setting of goals. Uh, and that makes a big difference because sometimes, you know, life is happening and, and uh, if, if, if we skip the, the planning stage in Ramadan, um, it, it makes a huge difference. Uh, there's a lot of regret at the end. I, I, I like that so much. And are you writing this, Sister Maria? Yes. Okay, so we talked about goals. We talked about prioritizing your goals. And we talked about short-term versus long-term planning. Yes? So who else? Anybody else? Okay, so basically, those three things are solution. If you remember in the beginning of the lecture, I said you have to have the intention. That's the, that's intending, you know, then you have to have the uh, willingness to do it. Like, you know, you have to evaluate yourself. That is the um, sister, you know, who mentioned about evaluation. You evaluate yourself and say, okay, uh, I am willing to do this. I want to do tahajjud. I want to finish the Quran. I want to do the I want to be a good Muslim. You have to be specific. Remember when we said before about setting goals? Like you have to be very specific about your goal. Don't say, I'm, I, I want to be a good Muslim. No, say exactly what you want. You want to be good in the salah and be more specific. Is it jama'ah salah? Is it fard salah? Is it sunnah salah? Is it tahajjud salah? You know, be very specific. And... Um, uh, so you have intention for the sake of Allah. You have the willingness to do it. I am. I want to do it. I want to start this as soon as it's possible. If I have the chance, I would start it. If I have everything set, I'm going to start now. So that's the willingness. And then you're going to 
sit and write your goals. And I told you that before in uh, some classes. Write down your goals. Just have a, what they call it, brain dump. Like, just put ideas in there, in the page. Piece of paper or a document or on your phone notes. And then look at them. Every time you remember, like say, you know, the next two days or three days, I'm going to write like my goals for the year. And keep writing until you have a good amount, maybe a good amount within a day, maybe a good amount within a, but don't go over a week, my advisor, don't go over a week, because it would be a waste of time. And then repetitions will happen. No, just write as many ideas as you can. Word, a word come to your head, an idea come to your head. I want to do this, I want to do that, I want in the goal, year goal. And then, you know, go and review them and categorize them. Categorize them. You'll have some financial goals, you'll have some physical goals, some mental goals, some spiritual goals, some family goals, some dreaming goals, whatever it is. Just categorize them, put them under segments. And then recategorize the categories. Try to you know, put the biggest, like, five to ten goals. Five to ten, not more than that. And then keep reading them. You'll find one of those goals, like, popping in your face. You keep going up and down, side to side, left to right, right to left, and that thing keeps, you know, coming in front of you. So that's goal number one right there, your priority. Put it in a separate page itself that goal and go back to the rest of the goals and try to recategorize them again if you can squeeze them some more that would be better if you can make the nine out of ten of course this one there you can make those nine three or four that would be great and that will come with prioritizing you say ah, i don't need this now uh nah maybe not this year maybe next spring maybe this so eliminate that one and put it in a separate sheet so you put one goal now, the main goal in one sheet, and you are working with this. And now the list of priorities eliminated on the side. Like you said, okay, this I can do within a year or after a year. So that doesn't belong to us now because we want a one, one year goal. And you do that until you find two, three more goals. That's it. And then the rest can be after one year, no problem. Things may happen during the year, by the way. You can also take one of those things that you... Uh, felt imminent and put them after one or two years, you can bring one of the things one or two years back. That's no problem because circumstances change. I'm talking about now. Within the first two weeks, we set the year's goal. And now we are in May or we just finished Ramadan. So we're sitting for next Ramadan. Already like a month, about a month. So before the end of Shawwal, you need to come up with that list. Okay? With that list. And then categorize and recategorize until you get like five to ten goals. And then you see which one is like the biggest one, put it in one sheet. And which one you can delay for next Ramadan, or after next Ramadan, so you put it away. So you'll have three, four goals you play with. And then, you know, try to see which one is like the most imminent after that one. And categorize them. That's priority number two. So you will have priority number one. That's the goal that you put aside. You may change it later after you finish this. So that's one goal. That is the main thing that I'm going to start like tomorrow, if I have it. And then you have priority number two. The things will will take from me like one to three months. Priority number three, like four to 12 months. And priority number four, the things that will happen next year. Okay. So once you're done with that, then you come up with a plan. That goal in front of you, let's use the sister who said that Quran, finish the Quran in Ramadan. So you are a person who's oriented to finish when you have a pressing timeline. <laughs> you see, that's, that's, that's the solution I was talking about. You want, you like to work under pressure. You like defined timelines and the shorter, the better. See? Whole Quran is like 30 Jews, that's 600 pages, and you were willing to finish them in one month. But when we say you get 
12 times the chance you don't want to do it. Why? Because you are a person who gets distracted easy. I'm not accusing you, by the way, or I'm not talking negatively here. I'm just saying I am. I get distracted easy. This is exactly what I am. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I get distracted easy, you know. My, my doctor told me that you have ADHD. <laughs> I told him, okay, nobody told me that when I was a child, and you're telling me now after I'm past 50. So <laughs> he said, yeah, because, you know, you become weaker and it starts getting in, uh, kicking in more. <laughs> so basically, I look for things to make me focus. So what I do, I start doing short-term goals. So instead of saying that you finish the Quran in the month of Ramadan, but you are not going to be able to finish the Quran every single month. And that's why it becomes hard. You can do that one shot every 12 months. That, well, that's great. So keep doing that. Don't go less. That's solution number one. Now, try to segment your goals. So divide Quran to 11, uh, to 10, let's say 10, not 11, 10, segments so you have 30 so three juz so you're going to finish three juz every month so by next ramadan you finish the whole quran and then you finish it once in ramadan now you're going to see something you see that the time that you finish quran in ramadan becomes easier on you and shorter huh so now you can finish quran in 20 days in ramadan instead of 30 or you can finish the quran twice in ramadan Guess what's going to happen after Ramadan? You're going to read five Jews a month instead of three. So you're going to finish the Quran every six months. See how beautiful this is now? And you go from there. So play with your goals according to your capacity, not the other way around, because you're going to get frustrated. Oh, I finished the whole Quran in Ramadan. People finish the whole Quran in Ramadan. Why do they become lazy after Ramadan? I just told you. Because, you know, they know Ramadan comes once a year and it's 30 days. So I would rather push myself, press myself, squeeze myself and finish it in Ramadan. But I cannot push myself, squeeze myself in, in Ramadan, every month like Ramadan. Ramadan comes only once. Well, I understand that. So you have 10 times the chance, but you do not have the incentive. You don't have the spiritual, you know, wholesale that happens in Ramadan every month. So yeah, that's fine. So just do what I told you. So divide the Quran over 10 months. And in Sha'ban, you have like warm up for Ramadan. So start finishing the Quran in Sha'ban. And you can finish in you know mid-Ramadan. Then you start another one and finish it by the end of Ramadan. Something like that. So Sha'ban and Ramadan put them together as one unit and finish the Quran twice in them. Until within a few years, you can finish the Quran every month. Now in Ramadan, you're not going to finish the Quran once for sure. I'm telling you 100%. If you finish the Quran every month regularly, every 30 days, so that means you read one juzi every day, that 20 pages you read every day, and it's not a big deal, by the way, because 20 pages every day, that's four pages after every salah. That's like seven minutes, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. You read four pages after every salah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah, assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. You do your adhkar, you hold your mushaf, and read four pages in the Mus'haf. Four pages Fajr, four pages Zohra, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, that's 20 pages, one juice of India before you go to bed. If you only read two pages, then read the most after Maghrib and Isha. There's no problem. I mean, you go around, you know, you tweak your plan accordingly. You know, the time you are busy with your family and all of that, see the time that you are not. See the time when your husband at work and your children at school, do you read most? And then, you know, before you sleep, you read, but 20 pages every day and segment them again. Goals, short goals, small goals are better. They add up. And on Saturday, Sunday, you read more. Or on Friday, you read more. Or whenever you feel more energy, you read more. And you go like that and have a sheet and calculate in it so you don't get confused. And have incentives. Reward yourself. Reward yourself. You know, reward yourself. Cook your favorite meal, you know. Um, uh, do something nice, you know, um, whatever it is. Ask your family to go out because you reach your goals for the month. When Ramadan comes, you finish the Quran every month, you finish at least three times. And Ramadan, because you are the other way around now. You are consistent in a certain act and Ramadan is spike. 
And when you spike, you come back again, not to where you're consistent at, but a little bit better. That was the two questions I asked. So you have to be consistent first and take it easy. You start with the low level. You don't have to have squeeze yourself hard. Have short-term goals. If you function with weeks, make weekly goals, daily goals, weekly goals, monthly goals, annual goals. If you are a person that annual goals makes you distracted and frustrated, so work with weekly goals. Say every Friday, I'm gonna review and I'm gonna do that. Also assessment is good in planning before you do. So you have the intention of the willingness and then you know, you have to see where you are. That is the self-evaluation. Now, well, I don't know how to read Quran good. Then I'm gonna put three months on learning the Qaeda Nuraniya with a sister, talking about you, you know, with the sister, uh, three months go to finish Qaeda Nuraniya, six months ago, or this year, I'm going to finish the Qaeda Nuraniya until I become fluent in reciting the Quran. That's self assessment. Because if you put a goal and you don't have the means or the tools, again, you're going to give up. You're going to give up fast. Okay. Uh, once you do that, then those are the things. You know, in psychology, they say it takes you about 25 days um, to develop a habit. But you have to do it consistently for 25 days. So if somebody say that, for example, I'm going to attend Fajr in Jama'ah every day in the Masjid. So they come to the Masjid for 25 days, it becomes very hard on them not to come to the Masjid. They will even will not be able to sleep comfortably or oversleep they have to come to the mansion unless there is something beyond their control, something pressing beyond their control. Um, and if they fail during the time they start again, 25 have to be 25 consistent. That's what they say, you know, you have to put the 10,000 hours of, of, of this and that. People who do wrestling or mixed martial arts or martial arts or something like that. They keep doing the same technique, the same punch, thousands and thousands of times until they develop a perfect uh, thing. And then they will know the nuance, the small nuances. And you don't see the difference. Like whenever somebody recites and they say, Ihdina surat al mustaqim, I tell them, Ihdina. And they say, Ihdina. And I'm saying, Ihdina. And they are saying, Ihdina. Do you see the difference? Anybody knows the difference? Yes, Sheikh. What is the difference? Uh, the ihdina is like majhul. You're not reading it right. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that in the in the pronunciation, do you notice any difference? It's ihdina versus ihdina. The yes. One of the kasra. Yes. You see. Your ear caught that, but not everybody. You see what I'm saying? So that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, why? Because I recite until the level that you can get the smallest and the slightest of difference. Your ear become very sensitive. Like if you train your eye, they become very sensitive. If you train your heart, it becomes very sensitive. If you remove the physical distractions, then your soul becomes very sensitive, receptive. You understand what I'm talking about? It becomes very receptive. That's why when Quran, Quran is recited in front of certain people, it moves them. Why? Because they removed any distraction when they are listening to the Quran, or when they are reciting the Quran. Their eyes are not distracted, their ears are not distracted. They are focusing 100% on there, or not 100%, as, as much as they could. And now it started giving them certain feelings. Ramadan, same thing, Hajj, same thing, Zakat, same thing, you know, saying the truth, same thing, helping others, same thing. So that's that's how we do things. So 25 days, they say. And also, amazingly, they say it's 25 years to change a generation's ideals or thinking. And that's why the media and things getting worse and worse and worse. And you see those kids, our kids who are just born now um, until they are 10 years old. So those who are from zero to 10, 
25 years from now, they're going to be 25 to 35 years old. That is the majority of the Muslim community in the U.S., for example. Majority of the Muslim community in the U.S. are youth between 17 and 40, by the way. It's like 75% of the Muslim population in the U.S. They are between the ages of 17 or 16 and 40. You see, you see how dangerous this is? And how, e how good it is also, if it's used right. Now, if all of them start thinking the same way and believe the same thing about their Islam in the West and that they are a power to reckon with, uh, then you see what the achievement can be done. You know, other communities succeeded in doing that. When they realize their self-worth and their importance, they know. So when you know the statistics, then you know. Now, all of us want our children just to have good secular education and all of that and not to be well grounded in Islam and Aqidah. Well, 25 years from now, you're going to cry, sit there and cry because your kids who are 0 to 10 will be 25 to 30. And if you're still around, you're going to see that they, all of them are working on the dunya. They are yeah, successful doctors, engineers, ITs, and AI, you know, artificial intelligence and all of that. They're making lots of money and all of that. But where is their salah? Where is their fasting? Where is their faith in Allah? Where is their love for and they're getting ready for akhirah? And you know what is the worst thing? Where is their ability to raise another Muslim generation? That is the dangerous part. You see? So whenever you, you want to see something 25 years from now, start now. I've been around here in the United States in Houston for more than 25 years. And I said things in Masjid Bilal and Champion when they were just mobile homes. And I said things on uh, khutbas and speeches and all of that. Many of those who are around, they say, Sheikh, you're right. I'm not talking about myself here. I'm just talking about idea. I was telling them, your youth are going to struggle with family life, social things. You know why? Because you came immigrants from overseas and you're busy to get the big house and the nice car and give yourself like, you, you spoon feed them and you do all of that. Those kids are not going to be a good husband and wife. In 25 years from now, and guess what? That's what happens. My generation, whenever they reached 40, we all had problems. We all had marital problems. Divorce happened. Children, some issues with the children. Why? Because this generation, our parents, and you know, did not put in us uh, how to and I'm not talking about myself specifically, I mean, that, that my generation who were born and raised here in the United States. I was not born and raised here in the United States. I came from Al-Azhar, so I have some values and some, I, you know, I came here when I was 23 years old. I'm now 50. I came here when I was 23 years old. And so 23 years old, I was raised, born and raised overseas and born and raised religious, religiously, you know, very... Um, strong, tough, religious environment. So, yet, the society affected me with all the precautions. Imagine the rest of my peers who were born and raised here and were just fresh out of college when I came here. Many of them, my friends in Houston here. 90% of them are divorced, including myself. You see? So it took 25 years for that to happen. Now, we are here now. That's the future I was talking about. And most of it actually happened. So those are parents now. But they're single parents, whether they're men or women, divorced. So what is going to happen to that generation who are now like 15 to 20 years old, our children? Do you think their marriage experience would be the same? You think they would be as consistent as we were? I don't know. Uh, the way they believe in Allah, the way they look at prayers and all that, those are not, they're not as scared of hereafter or anything like that as we were. Uh, 
But whatever you do, it will have an impact three, four generations to come. So we need to be consistent for that reason. It's, it's, it's pretty much scary, you know, for that reason, you know, be, be in front of your kids. Some of you would, might, might notice how I deal very gentle and nice with the children at the masjid. I don't care what people say they are disturbing or they're running or they're shouting. I, I, really, this is the least of my worries now. The, the biggest worry of all is before I depart here, when I'm sitting like in the masjid, in the, in the, not in the front lines anymore, I want to see those children, my children are in my place, some of them preaching and some of them listening. It doesn't matter who's preaching and who's listening. What matters is that both of them are consistently at the masjid because they love it. Focus on what I'm saying, sisters. It doesn't matter who's the sheikh and who's the listener. It does not matter. What matters is that there is a sheikh and there is a listener after we depart. That's what matters. What matters is each one of them is doing their part. One is talking and one is listening. One is leading and one is following. That's fine. But both of them feel that they need to continue coming to the masjid. They need to raise another generation like we did raise them. This will not happen if we're not consistent. If your child sees you going to the masjid once every blue moon, they're not going to go at all when they are able to. But if they see you consistent, then, then, then it's in the back of their head. Even if they're not consistent now, they're in the back of their head. You know, my dad used to do that. My mom used to do that. So that's why I want the children to have a good experience at the masjid. You know, if my door is open, my office door is open, bring them in. I'll shake hands with them and I'll give them some treat or something like that. I tell them I'm proud of you. Yeah, they need to see the head of the religious, um, you know, uh, you know, religious management in the masjid. They, they, they need to see that they are in good terms. They, they, are, they love to come. They want to see. Forget about my name now, but they want to see that person who is in... And on the top of the religious hierarchy in the masjid, he greets me and all of that. They need to have a reason to love the masjid and to come to the house of Allah. They need to have a reason to listen to the Quran and enjoy the tone and enjoy the music of the Quran. And, um, they need to love Allah Azza wa Jal. They're proud to be a Muslim. They need that. So we have to be consistent in doing this. To be consistent, and you know it's hard. We are willing to take take our children for swimming classes or soccer classes or martial arts, or some even take them to piano and dancing or whatever. I'm not endorsing now or saying right or wrong. What I'm saying is that you are consistent in those things. You dedicate, you plan. You know the value that will come out. So why not be consistent to yourself with introducing them to the religion of Allah, to loving Allah, to loving the Quran, to loving the Masjid? Those three, love Allah. Azza wa Jal, love his book, love the messenger of Allah, and love coming to the masjid. When that is initiated in the kids, and we're consistent about it, then results will come. Somebody want to say something? Sheikh, you're very right. Uh, alhamdulillah, uh, I know you've seen uh, our little ones in the masjid most of the time. <laughs> they, yes. Initially, they were very naughty, but uh, Alhamdulillah, I think with time, they they learn to love it and they're the ones who are motivating us to come also right um, i mean my son is only four years old but if you ask him what he wants to be when he grows up uh he has a very interesting answer <laughs> what is the answer what do you want to I'm be, be a chef. Allah Akbar. you will inshallah you know when you, you you keep coming and seeing me until you become better than me inshallah mm -hmm. how about that what do you want? Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Actually, this is good because Sheikh is not a job. You know, Sheikh is not a job. And I do not advocate it becomes a full time job unless the person is really, really invested in it. You know, and if, if they do something else, then they will not give the right of scholarship to uh, religious leadership. But in general, I want people to be successful in the dunya. They have their good income, the good skill that they depend on for their income and their livelihood. But then they become a scholar of Islam, like our previous scholars were. They were tradesmen. They were like 
um, people who have a skill, people who uh, do business, people who, uh, uh, you know, have their own uh, trade or, uh, you know, uh, craft or, um, you know, some, some function that they do, plus being a scholar. That's what I'm advocating for and uh, I want. Uh, but it's a good intention and a good encouragement as we encourage the children to do it. Anybody have any question about what I said? So today we're talking about consistency. Consistency is a key for continuing after Ramadan. That's the roadmap. Prioritize, and please listen to this lecture. Follow the steps I said about the prioritizing. Have a good intention, willingness. Assess yourself and see where you are, what you need. So your goal is to finish the Quran. Do you know how to read? Yes, but I don't read fluently. Work on that before you commit, and so on. Um, I'm going to fast three days every month. Well, start with one day and see how it goes. Uh, if it succeeds, say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to do it. After tomorrow, I'm going to do it. If you fail, no problem. Try next month. Try next week. Just keep trying until you succeed and then develop that habit and be consistent in doing it. Consistency, consistency, consistency is the key to continue what we were doing at Ramadan. Once you're consistent now, then before next Ramadan, your goal will be much, much higher. And expectation from yourself will be much, much higher. Uh, and then your performance will be a lot better. And after the following Ramadan will be over the roof. You know, you will be on top. Because, oh, I've been doing that all year long. And in Ramadan, I pushed myself and I did a little bit more. So I'm going to raise my bar in uh, consistent work for 11 months and so on. So the Muslim, their best of deeds are the last ones before they depart. Quality is great, especially when they get weaker. You know, when they pray, they are so much focused in the Salah because they've been doing that over tens of years. And they're improving, 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 improving. So the quality of their salah before they die is the best quality, even if they are praying sitting. Um, and may Allah make us all consistent, inshallah. I got to wrap up because I'm doing this lecture from home and I need to go to the masjid, inshallah, because I have I lots have, of work today. Questions? I have one, I have one question, sorry. Sure. Um, it's like um, when it comes to consistency and then priorities, when we put the priority um, of Islam and trying to read the Quran or whatever it is for our kids or for us personally, um, one of the things that's difficult is because there is a lot of consistency in the outside world that is not religious. Like when it comes to school, like you just said, or going to programs, those consistency are built in in this country. Like they're built in so well that you just follow a program, you go one, two, three, four, five. And I feel like that pressure sometimes, you know, it's fighting with the other consistency of reading the Qur'an, going to the Qur'an, and doing all this also, and to be successful in both at the same time. So what advice that, would you give? In but that's what I said in the beginning, a very good point, by the way. That's the advice I give in the beginning. I say that people are consistent even in doing bad, right? So I said that in the beginning. I said that, you know, consistency is key, and not only for good people. Actually, bad people are more consistent than good people. That's what life is. Um, Shaitan is very consistent in what he does and he does it with a passion and he does it professionally. I'm not saying good, but I'm saying professionally, skillfully he does it and he will not be deterred from his goal unless you are very strong and he finds that you are the deterrent. You are the one that he cannot get to and that's, that's where that's what, what you need. So you have to consider other consistencies as distractions. You are in a battlefield and you need to um, work hard to, to get to your goal because other people will contradict you. You want to be consistent in coming to the masjid, but the traffic is not in your favor, right? And people consistent on having a rush hour <laughs> at certain times. So how are you going to get over that? Being consistent, waking up early. So you develop another habit. So you have to work around. Don't, don't use it as an argument or as an excuse that, yeah, I'm consistent in doing this, but other people are consistent in fighting me. Well, yeah, train yourself. 
So you have to be consistent in upping your game all the time. You have to be consistent in conditioning yourself and toning yourself. It's like you go to the gym to tone yourself because you have a bigger goal to run a marathon. The training will not be like someone who just wants to upkeep their health. I hope I answered your question somehow. You did it a clock here. There again. Yeah. All right. So, Sister Maryam, please, uh, the right up, uh, mm -hmm. send it to me to proofread it. Any sisters want to add anything, send it to the group first. Any yeah. sister want to add to, to, to it, please do so. Then I'll proofread it, and then we're going to issue it. We're okay. going to issue it, and we're going to put it in the masjid page. You're going to oh, send it okay. to Brother, uh, brother Abdul Hamid Morsi or Brother Rida Bakas. Okay. And we're going to do it because my last khutbah, first khutbah was about consistency, but they lost the recording. So I'm going to repeat it this Friday, the second Juma. Mm -hmm. So basically, I will do that. And mm -hmm. yours will be like a handout. So can you get it ready, inshallah, before the Juma? Yeah, inshallah. I'll work on that. So I will submit it, inshallah, to Abdul Hamid. I'll tell him this is the explanation of the khutbah. Okay. All right, inshallah, I'll have it ready. Jazakallah khairan, and may Allah reward you all, sisters. And inshallah, please also, Sister Maryam, work on next week's topic, inshallah, okay? Okay. Thank all you, right. sir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum